Luke chapter 1. Since Christmas is coming, we're doing a series of sermons this Sunday, or this month rather, around the Advent season. Last week we looked at the wise men in Matthew chapter 2. This week, the birth of John the Baptist. No sermon series about the coming of Christ would complete, really, it'd be absent if we didn't mention John the Baptist as the forerunner to Jesus, okay? So, I'll just go through these verses with you. Uh, We'll take our time a little bit, draw some application for ourselves. Luke chapter 1, we'll pick it up at verse 5. Before I begin, let me just tell you, anybody know what John's name means? In the Hebrew, yes, ma'am. Uh, close? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John's name means Jehovah is gracious. Okay? Hebrew is Johanan. Okay? Greek is Ionis. We have it translated John. It's very simple, right? But it means God is, Jehovah is gracious. And that's really the main theme I want us to extract from the text this morning. That God is gracious. Grace. Grace, yes. Yes, grace. There's a lot of graces. Grace is an attribute of God. It's also the activity of God. Okay, I want want you to be clear on that. Because it's it's a word that is used so heavily in Christendom, rightfully so, and we depend on God's grace. But I just want to be sure and remind ourselves that we know what grace means, what it is. Uh, J.I. Packer said, grace is a personal activity, God operating in love toward his people. Webster's Dictionary simply says grace is favor, kindness shown to another. It's a verb, okay? It's kindness that is shown to another. God is gracious. He's kind. He has favor toward people. Grace is an attribute of God and it's the activity of God, as we'll see in our text this morning in this very famous story of Zacharias and Elizabeth. Last week we looked, about, looked at the wise men. This week at Zacharias and Elizabeth in the announcement that they will have a child and they'll name him Johanan. Jehovah is gracious. And God told them to name him that because God's sending a message to us prior to the coming of Christ that God is gracious. He's favorable toward you. Listen, brothers and sisters, let me just say this. His grace is what saves us, and it's His grace that keeps saving us. Amen? Amen. Sin abounds, grace much more abounds. Romans chapter 5. That means He keeps pouring out His favor and His kindness and His willingness to forgive us. You might come here with a heavy heart, because you've screwed up badly this week with word, thought, or action. Grace much more abounds. He keeps pouring it out through Jesus Christ. So today, the announcement of the birth of John through the angel Gabriel. I'm reading Luke, and I love Luke's account because he gives us the backstory. You know, in Matthew... Chapter 3, Matthew tells us that, um, what's it say? It says that in those days, John came preaching. That's how he introduces John the Baptist to us. Says nothing about his birth, his upbringing, his family, nothing. It's just John came preaching. In Mark's gospel, he just opens up and he quotes a couple of Old Testament prophecies from Isaiah and from Malachi that say John was a voice crying in the wilderness. He was a messenger, a preparer. That's Mark. That's how he introduces John to us. 
John the Apostle, who wrote the Gospel of John, he said, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Luke, I love Luke, because Luke gives us the human side. There was family. Now, I can relate to Luke, and I can relate, and that's why I wanted to read it, because I want God to relate to you. God wants to relate to you, and Luke brings God very close to us through the lives of these elderly people. They were senior citizens. It's quite fascinating, actually. When you read the whole story from Zacharias and Elizabeth, of course, Mary was a young girl, but then there was... Simeon and Anna. There's a lot of old people <laughs> that just filled with the Spirit of God and do a bunch of prophesying and singing songs. Amen. <laughs> it's good to see old people filled with the Spirit of God. <laughs> Whatever old is. <laughs> Verses 5 through 7. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. Now, by the way, when it says daughters of Aaron, it means that she was a descendant from Moses' brother Aaron, who was the first high priest. Obviously, she wasn't his daughter, but she was from his family line. So we have good stock here. These are a, a husband and a wife team that have come from uh, a priesthood. Uh, Zacharias is a country priest. Uh, we'll see later on, maybe next week, that uh, after Elizabeth becomes pregnant, spoiler, um, that she goes into the hill country, because that, that's where they lived. They came from the countryside, uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth. But they were priests. Now I want to talk to you about this for a minute. Because we're, we're going to, Luke is going to, we're going to follow Zacharias in his duty as a priest in Herod's temple. And by the way, I just wanted to point out, Herod was a historical figure who worked for the Roman government. This is historically, factually, histor it's, it's evident, it's, it's really happened. This old man and his wife serving in the time of Herod. And it tells us in verse 6, they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well advanced in years. Some commentators say they were in their 60s. Okay, I'm 66. So is Joni. I probably shouldn't have told you her age, right? <laughs> you don't do that to them. Right? I love teasing ladies. How old are you? Oh, how much do you weigh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, never goes well. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let me show you a few pictures. Zacharias was a priest, and he served in Herod's temple. There's a, there's a replica. That actually is a picture of a replica Life, not life-size, it's a miniature replica in Jerusalem. If you, when we go to Israel again on tour, uh, we'll go to this site and you can walk around. It's quite, you know, it's at knee level, but it's a, a, an accurate depiction of the temple that existed at the time that Zacharias was serving. And I want to point out to you that this area right in here is called the Court of Women. And it's not because that's where only women were allowed and they were segregated. It's just that women were allowed there, but also anybody was allowed there. And you could have upwards of 6,000 people. It was very sizable, okay? And then through those doors between this small little archway and that massive structure is where there was the altar of burnt offering and a laver for washing. And then through those big golden doors, that takes you into the holy place, where the priests would go every morning and every evening. Here's a floor plan. All right, maybe that's a little bit better to give you a perspective. All right, so 
massive courtyard, up a set of stairs, through the doors. Priests would do their stuff here. Then they'd go up those stairs and through that big set of doors. And here's this room where we have the altar of incense. There's a menorah or a lampstand and a table of showbread. And then there's a big old curtain separating that room from the Holy of Holies. Okay, next picture. So that gives you a little bit of perspective, if you can see that. Um, of, it shows a little individual right here. I guess you could say that's Zacharias at the altar of incense. In front of him is this massive curtain that's like 18 inches thick and 60 feet high, right, made of cloth. That's called the vow in the temple. And that vow was torn when Jesus died on the cross. In what direction was it torn? Top to bottom, amen. God sending a message. Come on in, have fellowship with me. All right? Embroidered on that big vow were angels. Were embroidered in that vow. In some of the temple depictions, they were engraved on the walls. The room was filled with images of angels. Okay? It tells us here in chapter 1, verse 5, that Zacharias was a certain priest of the division of Abijah. Okay? So what that means is that there was a, a division of labor, literally. And uh, Josephus says that there was a, probably about 20,000 priests that uh, it lived at the time of Zacharias, but King David, back in the Old Testament, took all those priests and he divided them into 24 groups. And so, 24 groups, there's 52 weeks in a year, all right? So, about twice a year, one group would be required to come from their hometown, in Zacharias's case, the hill country, and they were required to go into Jerusalem and to serve the uh, and serve God on behalf of the people for a week from Sabbath to Sabbath. Okay? So that's why he's saying the division, he was the eighth of the 24. And so at least twice a year, Zacharias would leave his home, he'd go to Jerusalem, and for about seven, for seven days from Sabbath to Sabbath, he would serve God on behalf of the people. He would serve God on behalf of the people. All right? His work, if you will, was in the service of God on behalf of others. There were other festivals, the Passover, Feast of Tabernacles, and such, where all the priests had to come, especially at Passover, because so many Jews would flock from around the, the world, really, and, the, and there was just so much demand that it required all 20,000 priests on deck to take care of business. The reason I'm telling you all that, brothers and sisters, is I love this. Zacharias is an older man. And for a long time, he has faithfully served as a priest. There was a certain rhythm and a certain regularity to his calendar, to the work, if you will, that he had to do. It was pretty much laid out for him. Year after year, month after month. When's Passover come? Put it on the calendar, babe. Got to go to Jerusalem. The reason I'm telling you that, friends, oh, may the rhythm of our lives have God at the center. And may He be a regular part of our calendar. Morning and evening. Day by day, year by year. Verse 6. They were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. I'm just taking a few minutes to introduce ourselves to this lovely couple. So far, so good, right? They're priests. She's a, comes from a, descended from the high priest. So it sort of told us about his vocation, if you will. And by the way, 
Their character here is now revealed to us in verse 6. It says they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of God. It doesn't mean, blamelessly, it doesn't mean that they were without sin. You know that. It just means they were honest and they were humble and they recognized they didn't make excuses for their sin and they didn't ignore their little compromises. They would bring it to God in repentance, whether they were in Jerusalem or out in the field back home. And they would do business with God in real life, day by day. That's what it's telling us. And I think that's really impressive because Zacharias was a priest. He lived and worked in a priestly culture that was notoriously bad. Right? You've read the Gospels. The chief priests, the Pharisees, the scribes. They were corrupt, evil men who wore the cloth. And puckered their lips when they were fasting and made everybody think they were really godly. And inside they were evil and wicked. They did not know God. And they went to church every day. Zacharias. That's the culture he lived in. I'd suggest to you they were refreshingly Honest and simple, real faith demonstrated through a real walk with God. A real, it says walking in all the ordinate commandments and ordinances. Walking is a New Testament term that means I'm living with God. He's walking with me. That's the main thing. And I'm walking in agreement with him. Two can't walk together unless they are agreed. So these people, their calendar, their life was ordered and it was centered really about the relationship with God. Wonderful people, wonderful people. Because of their faithfulness and devotion to God, I suggest to you that this elderly couple were just gentle, kind uh, respectful, thoughtful of others. Um, they really were just reflecting God's grace in their own lives, in the way that they had lived and were living. And then verse 7, and it gives greater meaning to everything we've already said. It says they had no child. Elizabeth was barren. They suffered. They were in that place, brothers and sisters, right really where you and I are, in that they have a real relationship with God, and at the same time, there's this inner sort of tension of, yeah, but, why? There's a excuse me, a sense of loss. There's a void that they had longed for and expected and it wasn't there and it never came. And there's that, that real tension that we feel as believers because we live in a world of, of loss, of void, of emptiness. Their home was empty. There was a brokenness. And there was that kind of odd dynamic of I love God and I'm walking with Him. And yet, there's been a loss. You might say there's been a loss of life. Some of you know that. You know what it feels like to have a loss of life. I could stretch that a little further and, and just say, well, the one that they had hoped for to be born would have been a, a little innocent one. Maybe you've had a loss of innocence through some bad choices. Take a lesson from the power of God's grace. That's our message. God is gracious. In their loss, in their suffering, this elderly couple turned back to God again and again and again. Look, they're real people. You can be sure it brought attention, it brought hardship in their relationship as a husband, as a wife. 
is they began to look at each other and going, I don't know if I can want to stay in this. This is not what I had hoped for. Elizabeth was barren. They were both well advanced in years. They, they lived in relationship with God through it all. And you know what impresses me? They continued to serve. Y'all know that. It can be hard to serve when you're struggling in your own heart, in your own home. And then there's a requirement in Zacharias's case that I go to work, if you will, for God in behalf of people, and I got my own troubles. But this man, and he had the support, I'm guessing, of his lovely wife, Elizabeth. He would go to Jerusalem, and he would serve. And he'd come before God, and he had his own troubles, and he would air them out, and he would find... God's grace affecting him over time. It can be challenging to serve God when disappointment and what seems like a lack of grace from him has been withheld. I just wrote down here, yet here in this aged couple, there was a grace and a gentleness that over time had changed their lives and they became extremely useful and a treasure to other people who are hurting. It's a reality at Christmas time, isn't it? Amen. From their fellowship with God, their hearts had softened and they had a witness. I'm so thankful for their witness. Well, that's Luke's introduction to this couple. I love his, the way he presents the parents of John to us, right? He, Luke is such a massive writer. He says in verse 8, so it was <laughs> that while he was serving as priest before God in the order of his division, all right, came up on the calendar, time to go to Jerusalem. He and others from his group all convened there, probably just before the start of the Sabbath. And there was kind of a passing of the guard, if you will, and everything's in order and okay. And here we go. And it says, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to burn incense and he went into the temple of the Lord, as you saw in the picture, right? All the people are standing outside. It tells us in verse 10 that the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And so it's an interesting thing. What's this deal about throwing, casting lots, right? Well, there was so many priests that rather than have them fighting for the right to go in and burn incense or trim the lamp, the menorah, and do all that. It's like, we'll take all the argument away from it and we'll just throw dice, if you will. And whoever name pops up, then you're on duty. And most commentators say that the, the privilege of going into that holy place that we saw the picture of uh, and burning the incense, which is a type of serving God on behalf of the people. He's bringing his prayers of the people and his own prayers before the Lord every morning, every evening. It was a privilege that would happen once in a lifetime. And once you've had the opportunity, you don't get a second chance. So it comes around once in your lifetime, more than likely. So Zacharias, he's there, he's serving, he's glad to be back in Jerusalem. It's kind of odd, there's a weird atmosphere because there's all these other priests there who live there and they're not very good people. But he's just kind of smells like a campfire. <laughs> you know, he comes from the country and he's just a simple man with just genuine faith. He's happy to serve. And they all stand and getting ready to dole out the responsibilities and the dice are thrown. Zacharias, yeah? He goes, guess what? You're burning incense today, boy. Holy cow. I, I get to go in right before the presence of God. And, I, and there's this little bowl that has some burning embers in it and he would go into this special mixture of spices and he would put them on there and it would fill the room with the fragrance. You'd just dump them on. The room would fill the prayers of God. Every morning or once in the morning and once in the evening. 
And so it was his big day. He's got his incense. Everything's ready to go. He goes in and everybody's outside in that courtyard, thousands of people, silently praying. And it says, Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, there was fear and trembling. Life group appreciates that. <laughs> we talked about that. He was just like, oh my God. <laughs> now what did this creature look like? I have no idea. <laughs> right? I don't know about you, but it's a big room and there's only one big menorah in there. So I'm guessing it's not really super well lit. But was this angel glowing? I don't know. But there he is. He's doing his thing, right? And it all happens fairly quickly. He, I'm sure he talked with guys who had done it before. It's like, okay, so tell me, what do I do when I get in there? Well, just put it down, say a few prayers, back away and come back out. And then you stand out on the balcony and you say, the, bless the people. Uh, number six, right? The Lord bless thee and keep thee. Make his face shine upon thee. And everything's great. And everybody goes home and yay, we worship God. So he's in there and an angel shows up. Now the angel's got a lot to say. Verse 13, the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias. Your prayer is heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you'll call his name Johanan. <laughs> All right. You bear a son, you call his name Johanan. Well, there's a whole lot of really interesting things there. This angel shows up, and what do we learn from this angel? He knows his name, he knows his wife's name, he knows his future, he knows the name of his future son, and he knows the circumstance in which he's living. And he tells him that I know your prayers. Your prayers have been heard. Have been heard. You ever feel like your prayers aren't heard? Gabriel tells us, your prayers are heard. He's come from the throne of God himself. How long did it take him to get from heaven to the temple? The blink of an eye. And there he is. How'd he get in? I don't know. <laughs> there he is. Hi. Uh -huh. <laughs> Zacharias, right? Elizabeth, right? Never had a kid, right? Guess what? You're going to have a kid. You're old. I, I got a little gray hair there. <laughs> he knows his name. He knows his future. God knows your future. He knows your future. And maybe your future won't turn out like you think it's going to. I'm looking at my graduates here. <laughs> I'm looking at so many that have graduated that I stay in contact with. Got a gentleman in mind right now. Sweet job, LinkedIn, sweet job. Gone through a lot of suffering, unexpected, been hard. Wonderful wife, doing well. It's drawn him closer to Jesus. Zacharias comes in, or sorry, uh, the angel said, don't be afraid. You know, those are the very first words we have recorded since the close of the Old Testament. You look at the chronology of Luke, he's telling us what happened with John the Baptist. This is before Mary, this is before anything, right? Before John's born. There hasn't been a prophet who has spoken for 400 years. Here comes an angel, and the very first words out of his mouth to mankind is, don't be afraid. God is gracious. Don't be afraid. He says in verse 14, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he won't drink. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, a very unique situation. This little guy is going to be spirit empowered, spirit filled in the embryo. That's pretty powerful. Verse 16, 
Gabriel just keeps talking. He says, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him, God, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So he tells us, you know, Zechariah and Elizabeth are the only people, right? They're going to give birth to John. They're going to pass before John grows up and does all this stuff. So it's really gracious of God to tell him, you haven't got to worry. When you say your goodbye to your son, when that day comes, I'm telling you right now, he's going to be a, he's going to be a big man on campus, okay? <laughs> he's going to, his footprint is going to be left. It's going to be large, all right? Uh, it sort of struck me that he says in verse 16, he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord our God. That's an interesting statement. Wait a minute. This, this is God's chosen people. But he says he's going to turn them back to God. Well, I thought they were with God. They're his chosen people. No, just because you're here today doesn't mean you're a Christian. You all know that, right? But praise the Lord, I think you're here today because you are a Christian. Because at some point in time, the Spirit of God moved in your life to turn you from self, self-absorption in sin, turned us to God to find forgiveness and find Him gracious and loving us and wanting a relationship with us. Turn means to turn or return. So, yeah, you know what, friends? Don't hang on to your stuff. You got sin in your life, just get it out. Confess it. Just go back to the cross, that beautiful cross. Oh, Lord Jesus, you died for me. I confess it to you. Just forgive me, wash me, cleanse me, and I'm moving on with you. Sin abounds, grace much more abounds. We return or we turn. Many of the people, there's a lot of people that needed to know about God's grace. He'll go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. Elijah was a a reformer, you might say. He was a fiery, odd duck. (laughs) He wore camel skins and kind of reclusive and lived out in the wilderness. And he came in and he was confrontational. He wasn't afraid of anybody except Jezebel. (laughs) Right? He was a courageous spokesman for God. He says he's going to go in the spirit and power of Elijah. We need prophets like that today, amen? Amen. Aidan Tozer, A.W. Tozer, defined the kind of prophet in his description of of that old-time prophet. I think it fits Elijah and I think it fits John the Baptist. Tozer said this, A prophet, like Elijah or John, he's a man who has seen visions of God and heard a voice from the throne. And when he comes, he will stand in flat contradiction to everything our smirking, smooth civilization holds dear. He will contradict, denounce, and protest in the name of God and will earn the hatred and opposition of a large segment of Christendom. Such a man is likely to be lean, Rugged, blunt spoken, and a little bit angry with the world. He will love Christ and the souls of men to the point of willingness to die for the glory of the one and the salvation of the other. Well said. That was John the Baptist. Well, verse 18. It said, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wealth, wife is well advanced in years. Like, uh, like you're an angel, I'm a human. So maybe there's a little bit of birds and the bees thing you don't quite understand. <laughs> but she's an old woman and I'm an old man and it just, those days are gone. <laughs> Interesting. You know basically what he's saying here? He goes, I understand I just don't believe. It's exactly the opposite of Mary. Because this same angel shows up to her and tells her something even more supernatural. 
that you're going to conceive without having sex. And she goes, I believe you. I just don't understand. Very, very different. Zacharias is like, I understand. I just don't believe it. And so he's like, prove it. Show me a sign. It seems inconceivable to me. Did you all get that? All right, thank you, Brandy. <laughs> all right. The angel answered and said to him, now notice this, I am Gabriel. I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings or good news. I've just told you good news. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. All right. So what has Gabriel just basically said? I'll tell you what he basically just said. He said, you know, I'm a fellow servant, just like you, Zacharias. I serve God on behalf of people. And I have come from his throne and I'm telling you the words of God. And so you're asking me, show me a sign. I'm telling you, you've just heard absolute truth. Which therefore, it's authoritative, which means it's sufficient for everything you need to know. Just go home and be with your wife. The word of God, my brothers and sisters, reveals to us the grace of God. Isn't that interesting? Sometimes it's hard to receive God's grace, isn't it? Here's a man who spent his whole life serving on behalf of others. And now he has this wonderful manifestation. And he's like, I'm here to bless you, son. I want you to receive. I want you to be blessed beyond anything you could have imagined. And so it's like the only sign you need is to believe that I've just given you straight up truth and it's authoritative. But since you didn't believe it, I'm going to strike you dumb. <laughs> a little bit of a judgment thing there, right? Kind of an interesting thing there to me that, uh, you know, I don't know exactly why. Apparently Gabriel's got uh, authority to make snap decisions. Right? I don't know if he knew this was going to happen, but he had the authority. He was like, okay, well, you're not going to speak. Not until the baby's born, until these things are fulfilled. Why did he do that? I don't know, but I can draw a few applications from that. If I don't believe, I can't preach the good news. I got nothing to say. Just like Zacharias. I've got, or maybe it's, my silence and obedience can be just as effective as my words. Or maybe Gabriel thought it's better to keep you in your unbelief than you walk around and infect others with your unbelief. Right? Let, you, let them hear the word of God. Well, meanwhile, back outside the temple, it says the people waited for Zacharias and marveled that he lingered so long in the temple. But when he came out, he could, he could not speak to them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned to them and remained speechless. Now that's kind of a funny scene, isn't it, to you? He's standing on the top of the set of stairs, and he's supposed to utter the blessing, right? Numbers. He can't talk. And uh, clearly something's wrong. And so now he's playing charades. <laughs> he's like, I don't glowing angel. I don't know. Like, what, what did he say? Uh, I don't know. Wife. Uh, pregnant. <laughs> you know. <laughs> People are yeah, trying to answer. Weird scene. Verse 23 to the verse 25. It says, so it was as soon as the days of his service were completed after he, so he continued to serve until the end of the next Sabbath came around, that he departed to his own house. Walks in the house, hey babe, welcome home, dinner's ready. Mm, can't say a word. <laughs> She's like, praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> he 
Yep. Oh, man. You know, it's interesting that when John was born in Luke chapter 2, uh, all, everybody in the community came around. They said, uh, as Elizabeth said, name him John. And they're like, what do you mean name him John? You name him Zacharias. He's, he's your one and only son you're ever going to have. Give him your father's name. She said, no, his name's supposed to be John. Then they turned to Zacharias and they're like, what do you want us to call him? And it says they gave him a writing tablet and they made signs. So evidently he not only lost his speech, he lost his hearing. So he gets into the sign language thing. Interesting. So he comes home to his girl. He's trying to explain and he writes it all out. And she just smiles. She's like, oh my goodness. God's grace filled their lives, brothers and sisters. In their suffering, in their emptiness. God came to this lovely couple. And he filled them with hope. And he renewed their relationship. And he gave them the strength and sort of the maternal spring burst again in her life. And they enjoyed intimacy. And there was conception. How did she know that? I have no idea. Maybe a little movement. There was no stoppage of the monthly cycle. She's long beyond that. God's grace, his favor and his kindness came to this people. And I want you to call him John so that when you're gone, everybody will go, Jehovah is gracious. And there's a lot of hurting people in this world who have had loss, who have lost innocence, who have a lot of scars and deep, deep things in their life, mentally and emotionally. Oh, Jesus, how we need you how we need you to come and, and just conceive in us hope and faith again in your greatness. And if you choose not to, it's still well with my soul. Famous lines, right? Mercy me, even if, right? Night after night, I go on the stage and I sing to the broken. But on this night, I just don't think I can. I'm broken, but it's well with my soul. Verse 24, after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived and she hid herself for five months, saying, I want you to hear the sound of grace coming out of her mouth. Thus the Lord has looked upon me with favor in the days when he looked on me, or has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me with favor to take away my reproach among people. She lived so many years listening to the snarky remarks of her friends who didn't understand. Like Job's friends, ah, we think there's something wrong, Job, or all this calamity wouldn't have fallen upon you. You've got some hidden sin there, brother. And that's what she's saying. To not have a child as a Jewish woman, this was, it was a disgrace. But people just, she heard the backbiting and the, and the, the, and the despising. The people just had all these remarks that were made about her. Maybe she thought that about herself. I'm just, just, I'm just no good. I'm unclean of some kind. There's something wrong with me. I'm defective. That's what shame tells us, right? I'm just defective. I'm just a, somehow not quite where I should be. And I feel less than everybody. And God's grace takes that away. When you meet Jesus Christ, he takes that away. And it might be a lifetime of learning that glory of not walking in shame. It might well, I shouldn't say a lifetime, hopefully not a lifetime. Hopefully we grow in grace, as Peter would say. But there might be a lot of hard days, a lot of hard times, times of depression. Times where you just go, I I'm just can't see anything good. And it's hard to see God in all that. But his grace is his personal activity. 
that keeps flowing out toward us. So in that, you go back to him. You run back to Jesus. You hug him and you hold him by faith. You be honest like Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were faithful, walking in obedience, blamelessly. Those are the words of grace. That's the, that's the testimony of Elizabeth coming to us about how great God is. The Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked on me with favor to take away my reproach. Now, why she went into seclusion for five months? That's a good question. I don't know. Some of you might have a better answer than me. But for the sake of my preaching, <laughs> I think she waited until there was a little bump. And then she could go around and she could prove. <laughs> it's the fruit of the womb. And y'all know that's God's work, not mine. What's the, what's the evidence of grace in our lives? Fruit. It's being more like Jesus, right? Love and joy and peace. Joni's teaching that to the Sunday school class right now. They got a little song they sing. Fruit of the Spirit. Right? So she's just, it's the evidence of grace is the fruit that manifests in our life. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. That's our message this morning. Advent season. Zacharias and Elizabeth. God is gracious. Run back to Him and stay with Him all the time. Let's stand and pray. Thank you, Lord. Before I pray, I just want to remind you to grab one of the surveys. We do truly want to hear back from you. Uh, and then contact information is there. You can send your remarks back to leadership. And then also when I say amen, just uh, stack the chairs to the left and right and we'll bring the tables in and we'll be eating in a few minutes. All right, Lord, thank you for this lovely story that Luke gives us of a real man, a real woman, who encountered God in a way they had not expected, how you filled their lives with joy. Yeah, it had a real outcome. There was a son. But I thank you, Lord, for their faithfulness, for the testimony that they served you and loved you and walked with you. And, and Gabriel acknowledged that. I thank you, Lord. May we emulate them. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Blessings to you.